Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. good morning, all of you lot on Zoom as well. It's a real joy to be back with you in physical church. But we know that Zoom church will need to continue for many people. And you are equally loved of God and equally part of our celebration as we're here. Today, it's the Feast of the Holy Trinity. So we join together in our first hymn, humming in church, singing, if you're virtually present, immortal, invisible, God only wise.
Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Saviour. Amen. God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us, your servants, grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Be safe.
Eine Lesung aus dem Buch des Propheten Jesaja. In dem Jahr, als der König Usia starb, sah ich den Herrn sitzen auf einem hohen und erhabenen Thron und sein Saum füllte den Tempel. Seraphim standen über ihm. Ein jeder hatte sechs Flügel. Mit zwei deckten sie ihr Antlitz, mit zwei deckten sie ihre Füße und mit zwei flogen sie. Und einer rief zum anderen und sprach, heilig, heilig, heilig ist der Herr Zebaoth. Alle Lande sind seiner Ehre voll. Und die Schwellen bebten von der Stimme ihres Rufens und das Haus ward voll Rauch. Da sprach ich, weh mir, ich vergehe, denn ich bin unreiner Lippen und wohne unter einem Volk von unreinen Lippen, denn ich habe den König, den Herrn Zebaoth, gesehen mit meinen Augen. Da flog einer der Seraphim zu mir und hatte eine glühende Kohle in der Hand, die er mit der Zange vom Altar nahm und rührte meinen Mund an und sprach, siehe, hiermit sind deine Lippen berührt, dass deine Schuld von dir genommen werde und deine Sünde gesühnt sei. Und ich hörte die Stimme des Herrn, wie er sprach, wen soll ich senden? Wer will unser Bote sein? Ich aber sprach, hier bin ich, sende mich. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read the psalm responsibly. I will begin. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord splits the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kaddish. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees rise and strips the forests bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king evermore. The Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. 
the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. If you're at home, make yourself comfortable. This will not be my longest sermon, but I don't think I can attack such a topic as big as the nature of God without giving a little bit of time to it. This I'm going to start with talking about the gospel that we've just heard. It's from the third chapter of John. And in fact, it hasn't been that long since we heard it already once in 2021. It was also selected for a Sunday at the beginning of Lent. And the fact that it 
repeats again so soon now gives us an understanding of how the church decides what readings should be read on any given Sunday. And, and, and I'm, this is a little bit like adult Sunday school here for the next couple of minutes. Uh, it's not going to be an inspiring part of the sermon, but it is an educational part. And so I, I hope I'm going to say something you've always said, oh, I, I'm, I don't think I was aware of that. You know, the, the church calendar is really divided into two parts. There is the first part, which is what we might say is the life of Jesus, about the promise, the birth, the growing up, the baptism, the preaching, the arrest, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Ends with the ascension and the sending of the Holy Spirit. And in that half of the year, we, we, we come to understand about Jesus, who he is, where he come from, what his purpose is. But we still have another half of the year yet to go. And you can think about the second half of the church calendar, the, the season that is from today all the way until Advent, as the teaching part of the calendar, where every Sunday lessons are selected, which not talk about Jesus as a man, but talk about his teachings, his philosophies, his, his theology, if you will. Uh, we listen to him telling parables and doing demonstrations of power and then explaining things. You know, this teaching season is a, a whole new opportunity. And then sometimes we repeat the lessons we heard when first we listened, they were about the chronology, now they're about the theology. I think it's very helpful because frankly, some of these lessons are complicated and we need to hear them over and over again. So we're in the beginning of the second part of the church year. And what is the very first theme the church gives us? The Holy Trinity which is another way of saying, we're gonna start by trying to see what can Jesus teach us about God? It's a very, very good strategy, really. Begin with the beginning. Go to the very most important aspect of our whole religious life, and let's all at least try to get on board with that. In the beginning of the church, there was a wide variety of understandings about who God is. How's he connected to Jesus? How is the Holy Spirit active in the life of the church? Do you have to be a member of the church to be able to do this? Or can you be outside the church and still receive? And it went for several hundred years, the church trying to figure out who are we, who is God, and how are the two things connected? It wasn't an easy discussion. There were times when there were outright riots with death-dealing crowds fighting with blood over the issue, who is God? It's, it's a little bit hard to imagine now. In civilized Western society, we might discuss things, we might even violently disagree, but uh, it probably wouldn't extend to anything more than maybe some harsh words on the internet. But uh, that don't forget the example of Alexandria in Egypt, when Athanasius was the, the bishop of Alexandria. And the followers of Athanasius disagreed so violently with the followers of the priest Arius that they actually formed little militia armies and ran through the streets, destroying the shops of each other, destroying the, the, the buildings and, and killing one another because that's how important God was knowing the truth about God was very compelling. So compelling that the emperor decided, well, we've got to settle this once and for all. And he called a council of all the bishops from around the Mediterranean area, which meant all the bishops there were, and they gathered together near Istanbul in a little town, which we in English say Nicaea. And they produced this thing called the Nicene Creed, so stating sort of in a doctrinal way, this is what the church officially believes about God. And when you look at the Nicene Creed, it's structured very much like the baptismal creed we call the Apostles' Creed, where it's got, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Holy Spirit. 
And then it talks about the Holy Catholic Church and the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. And so, but it's structured in a way that every aspect of God's creative power, his salvific power, and his sanctifying power are all included in this simple doctrinal statement. It took years for the bishops to be able to gather and agree on how this text would be written. And um, we're going to be saying the Nicene Creed here as soon as the sermon is over. So you might want to read it a little more carefully than you normally do. Don't just say it from memory, but actually look at it and its structure and see how it's very Trinitarian. Because this is the result of the Nicene Conference, that the Trinitarian believers of God were vindicated and the Arianism of the opponents was condemned. Though I think, frankly, there are still a lot of closet Arians amongst those of the church, because, frankly, the Trinity is a very difficult thing to believe. We think that somehow our belief has to be founded on understanding. I don't understand it, therefore I can't believe it. But I don't think that's what the early Christians ever had as their their modus operandi. I think it was always, we don't understand it, therefore we will try to believe it. Because we can't define it, we affirm it. And the Nicene Creed wasn't a doctrine that said, now we've figured it all out. Instead, it was a document that said, this is like the least common denominator. These things, at least, we can agree on, even though there will be many other things we can't. We can't understand God so completely that we can ever, in any language, in any culture, in any scholastic academic process, say, we have finally figured out God. Anyone who thinks they have done that must have a very small God. I've said this before, and I, I probably have said it here in Munich. I can't remember. It's been almost eight months now, and I, uh, when I, you speak extemporaneously, you, you, you oftentimes do it, tend to repeat yourself. And I, but this is worth repeating. We have given ourselves a small brain, and God is not a small thing. We can understand a lot of big ideas, but no idea as big as God can ever be fitted into one single brain. Even all of us together as a society do not have the capability, even all the computers and all the memories and the processing of the greatest machines we could possibly build would never be able to contain the scope and the breadth and the full understanding of something that is eternal, infinite, and omniscient, which is what we say determines that he is God, that God is a God. So, so we, we, we come down in, in this gospel lesson from John the, chapter 3 to really see that Jesus also has a little bit of a hard time revealing to Nicodemus and to all those to whom he preached uh, exactly who is he, who is the Father, how is he connected, you know, what is all this with God. And he resorts sometimes to making statements like, I tell you, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you know, it's like, okay, there's an official proclamation, which I think in modern sense we might say is doctrinal. Believe it because I said so. And then he also resorts from time to time, giving examples like the wind blows, you don't know where it comes from, you don't know where it's going, but you know the wind exists. You know, he's using examples of nature to make theological point. So we have... In the Bible, we have a doctrinal approach to revelation, and we have a natural approach to revelation. And then we are challenged to use our own brain, use the Holy Spirit that has been gifted to us, and to try to affirm even what we don't understand. To confess, to proclaim, to preach even things that words can never say. And so it is, a, it is a difficult task. And there is that old joke that says, in every pulpit in the world on Trinity Sunday, heresy is preached, which is only true because none of us can claim that we actually have the absolute truth because we're talking about something we don't 
know about. I've uh, been more persuaded in my own spiritual life by the natural revelation that I am the doctrinal. I, I, I have a little bit of a, this American rebelliousness against authoritarianism. Uh, some people just call it immaturity. I don't know. But uh, when somebody says, this is what you must believe, I am immediately stiffen my back and I say, why? And start thinking instantly of reasons not to go along with it. But natural theology, natural revelation, is something that uh, I, I do find comforting. You know, we, okay, take the, the example of God as the Trinity, a three-part entity unified totally and yet distinctive in the three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Some people prefer to call it the Creator, the Sanctifier, the Redeemer. You know, there could be these functional Trinitarians and there could be relational Trinitarians. They're all seeking to say, God is three, God is one. How that works, I don't know, but in nature we see it repeated and reflected. Uh, there is an example, of course, uh, what, what we've always believed, you know, nature is made up of three dimensions. We have height, breadth, and width, or height, depth, length, however you want to, you, which words you want to use, but this is how we perceive reality. Our, our eyes and our brain work. Uh, if you ever lose one lens out of your glasses, you'll understand how losing that perspective makes reality seem very threatening. But when we can say, yes, he's smaller because he's farther away, you know, it, it helps us understand what we perceive. And so we can say, well, those three, three dimensions really is that a reflection of the fact that creation was made by a creator who is also three? I can't say for sure. Maybe it is. But in natural theology, you don't expect to have absolute doctrinal truths revealed. You have hints of things. And I find this to be a very comforting fact that it seems that creation as a reflection of the creator is structured in a way that we have these traditional three dimensions. Now, everything's always changing, isn't it? And as science advances, we hear more and more talk about alternative dimensions and different ways of perceiving things. And, and it may be that a uh, hundred years from now, nobody will be persuaded at all or find it at all comforting that we used to think there were only three dimensions. But, but it's natural theology. It's a, there's also this uh, perception of time. And since creation is the space and the time combined, I like the fact that there are the three perceptions of time. There's the past, the present, and the future. Is this also perhaps some kind of a, a reflection of the fact that God works in creation on a chronological timeline? So that at even any given point, we know where we are right now, we know where we have come from, and we have some kind of understanding where we might be going. So the past, present, and future also. Is this a Trinitarian hint? Uh, possibly. If it works for you, feel free to use that. There is also, in language, especially in German, but in creation we will often find, you know, that nouns and things, objects in our brain, we categorize them into male, female, or neuter. Now in English there's a lot more neutral. In German, there's less neutral and a lot more male and female. The, uh, the languages can differ. There are some languages that don't seem to have any genders. But again, do we think in a Trinitarian way because it's a reflection of the Creator? Or has perhaps the church's understanding of Trinitarian reality influenced the way we categorize our experiences? You know, I'm not able to say at this point which comes first, the chicken or the egg. But I do know that all of these natural theology revelations, they're inadequate to help us get to the actual truth. They're, they're sort of like when you look at this triangle here on the front of, I'm sorry, camera people, you can't see, but here, uh, well, look on the front of your liturgy sheet, you also see the same thing where there's a tr uh, the triangle and there's also the interlocking three circles. We don't have the circles down here, but 
These are two ways the church has tried to graphically give us an image of what Trinity can mean. And, uh, and some people find that helpful, you know, to say, well, it's a very stable form, the, the triangle like that. It's a good solid thing, it's like the pyramid, you know, they can't really fall over. You know, they're, they're so based on such a big thing. And, and you know, there is, there is uh, some helpfulness in being able to vision them. But just as languages change so that the, you know, the genders might not be very important in some time, uh, the, the perception of dimensionality changes. And so maybe there are more than three. You know, I, I think that the images we use to describe the Trinity, they also, in my lifetime, they have come to be a little less meaningful because as a cultural uh, being, uh, humanity has moved forward into a new understanding of creation that doesn't allow this triangle thing to be very satisfying anymore. It, science uncovered something that we, I don't think the ancient people knew, the medieval people uh, denied, uh, but uh, the, even into the 19th century, people opposed this notion. And it's the notion of uh, dynamic movement of all creation. Go back to the Adam and Eve story. There's no sense that there are days and nights. There's no sense that the, the, there are uh, motions. It's just sort of like a set piece. We, we, we get into the, the ancient Greeks and they had the idea of the, the earth right in the middle and the, everything rotating around. They had the sun and the moon, but earth was unchanging. Unchanging. Immutable was the theological word. God is immutable. God never changes. And then something like Hubble telescope happens and big satellite dishes listening to the noises of distant galaxies and uh, the Doppler shift, the red shift, where when light is moving toward you or moving away from you, the color spectrum changes. You know, there are lots of scientific adv advancements that challenge the immutability, not only of Earth, but of the whole of created universe. Are we all still expanding from the Big Bang? Is the Milky Way really a giant spiral spinning out in this emptiness of space? We know our Earth is flying through the nothingness around the sun. Even on Earth, we're spinning like this. A tremendous speed. We don't necessarily feel it in our beings, but when we know it's scientifically true, it changes the triangle, which is so immutable, into something that has got to have massive energy and dynamism. It's almost like if you take that triangle and you put it on a stick on a nail and then you spin it, it goes it's like a pinwheel and you look at it it's no longer a triangle anymore it's a circle the faster it spins the more solid that disc looks you can you can spin it so fast you swear you're no, no longer looking at a triangle you're looking now at a flat circle we we don't perceive the motion but it's there we know it's there so that our image of an immutable creation following in the image of an immutable creator has got to be thrown out the window. We have a very changing, evolving, dynamic creation. And if that's going to be a reflection of God, then we should have a dynamic, energetic, moving, ever-changing understanding of, of God. So, this is why it's hard to understand. This is, I'm not, I, I, if you thought I was going to give you the answers, I'm sorry, I can't. You know, I don't really think God expects us to figure him out. I don't think God expects us to say, now we finally understand it. I don't think God cares how smart we are. Ultimately, God cares what we're willing to affirm 
accept, cling to, hold dear, love. I can affirm the Holy Trinity, but don't ask me to explain it. And why can I affirm it? Because I hope the Holy Trinity. And why do I hope it? Because the God of the Holy Trinity gives me love. And I need it. So in the name of love, and in the name of hope, I proclaim to you this great and glorious mystery. The mystery of God. The mystery of a creator, a redeemer, a sanctifier, a father who bore a son, a son who granted a spirit, the spirit who went forth from the father to do the creation, to redeem the son, to give the spirit, you know, this dynamic, ever-changing, spinning energy of God. I affirm God as an act of love, and I invite you to do the same. As we say together, the Nicene Creed. So we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and conscious Pilate. In accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. For our bishops, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. For the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. For this city, 
for every city and community, and for those who live in them. Let us pray to the Lord. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and suffering, let us pray to the Lord. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Defend us, deliver us, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. In the communion of the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To thee, Lord our God. And today we pray especially for thee, who has now returned home and is being looked after by her daughters and professional carers. We pray for Andrea in Rome. And we pray for the soul of her late husband, Mario. Almighty and merciful God, who sent your Holy Spirit to steer us through troubled waters in past years, be with us again now as we journey through the process of finding a new priest in charge. With your small voice of calm, guide the minds of our bishop and everyone involved, and graciously grant that we will, with open hearts, receive a faithful priest to lead us from strength to strength in the building up of your kingdom, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace be with you.
So uh, those of you in the church, if you can be seated, we have a few announcements and words of welcome. I want to follow up first on what George was saying about our sister Dee. She is home from the Barmherziger Bruder, uh, but she's, she's not well yet, but her daughter uh, spoke to me just this morning and she gave me a couple of lines of hope. She said she's eating much better than she did, which is always important if you want the body to heal. And that she perks up much whenever somebody calls or when she gets a card in the mail. Dee is a very social person and being in an isolation ward at a distant hospital, being very institutionalized was, I think, another ailment. But being at home in her familiar surroundings, cared for by people who know and love her, it's, been, it's a good situation and I can hope for the best. Sarah, the, the daughter that I spoke with, encourages anybody who would like to talk with Dee not to come by and visit because it's still quite an a, a antiseptic situation that they're trying to maintain, but that she loves phone calls and that anybody who calls should try to do so in the afternoon when her biorhythm is a little more active. You know, she's a little bit more. She said, if you don't get an answer, it's because they won't answer when she's asleep. And so that, because that's the most important thing. But she says cards are also very good because she really pours over every card with gratitude. In the back, Roger has placed the newest copy of the icon. Those of you who might be watching from home, if you notify us at the church office that you haven't gotten one yet, we will make sure that you get one. Also in the back, the, it's perfect timing today, being the Feast of the Holy Trinity. Holy Trinity Cathedral, our cathedral in Paris, has sent us copies of their parish magazine called The Trinity. And those are also back, and you can pick up one if you would like to know what's happening at the cathedral in Paris. Janet, would you make some further announcements? So you may want to move away a little bit because I want to remove my mask. So good afternoon. It is wonderful to see so many people here today. It really does feel like coming home. If I was allowed to, I would burst into song, but I am not. So just think from my heart, I am singing just to be back here. To go on what Ken was saying, the icon is a labor of love specifically from Sue and Roger and the team that they have. So thank you guys very much. It is wonderful to have this back in our lives. Um, so after church today, you probably saw as you came in, the outreach committee, specifically today, Barbara and Liz have prepared little Trinity cookies for us. Oh, sorry. Trinity cookies, uh, shortbread it looks like, um, for us just to have a hint of what coffee hour used to be like and to have time to socialize at a distance with each other. It's a wonderful idea and a wonderful welcome. And we look forward to to a future when we will be able to do this more often and also in the Gemeinde Saal. Um, to the announcements, there is a big thank you to Peter Dalen for organizing and arranging to get the Sanctus and the Gloria sung and Mitchell for kind of leading the, the, the singing. It was wonderful to hear everybody hum today in here. You couldn't hear on Zoom, but the entire, entire church was humming along with Mitchell. And this is just so wonderful to have music back. Um, Ken's last Sunday is the 27th. If you do want to spend some time with Ken, please make sure that you give him a call because as I said, his dance card is filling up really quickly. The time has just flown by and we will really miss you, Ken. I'm not even gonna go there. I'm not there. sure that dancing is socially distanced enough to even use as a metaphor. <laughs> okay. Um, 
a belated um, happy birthday to Jeff, Jeff Leipzig, our uh, music director, whose birthday was yesterday. And on the priest in charge search update, the vestry is hard at work. Um, you have elected an incredible and dedicated vestry who take this responsibility very seriously. And I would like you to keep us as a vestry and as individuals on the vestry in your prayers each day. Um, we, are, we are blessed with a slate of very strong candidates. We are listening as hard as we can to the Holy Spirit and we will, we will keep moving forward in the process. Then just quickly, the Racial Justice Book Club. Jane Shiring is here today. If you have a question, we will meet on June 12th at four o'clock to discuss Tina Hesey Coates Between the World and Me. And last, if not least, in the back of your announcements, there is an invitation to the Academy of Parish Leadership, um, Gracious Leadership, going over two weekends. If you were not able to attend all the sessions, please try and attend some. Um, I personally think these will be very helpful as we move forward in our goals and our visions for the, for the Church of the Ascension and as we bring on a new priest in charge. And the EFM um, that Kay is leading uh, is again, I think starting again in September. So please contact Kay if you have any questions. Thank you. I wanna just ask the tech team if you can put the pictures up of everybody at home up there. I challenged them, you know, Liz and Barbara were gonna make these triangle cookies. And I just wondered if anybody at home was able to bring to their service the triangle cookies I challenged them with. Any, any hands raised of cookies that you brought or triangular thing? Phil's got a triangular image in his box. Well, okay then. So we get them all to ourselves, that's fine. I apologize that you don't get these beautiful cookies, but have a happy Trinity regardless. And I'm gonna turn the service back now to our celebrant, Ali. Yours, <clears throat> yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O oh Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. We continue in worship with him 362. Please stand as you're able.
Give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For with your co eternal Son and Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord in Trinity of persons and in unity of being. And we celebrate the one and equal glory of you, O Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, we sing. to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Saviour and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, 
he took the cup of wine and when he'd given thanks he gave it to them and said drink this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink it do this for the remembrance of me Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. The gifts of God to the people of God.
Please stand as we pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. May the countenance of the Lord rest upon you and give you peace. Amen. Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the holy and undivided Trinity, guard you, save you, and bring you to that heavenly city where God lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord.